This is the Next Simple Step Podcast. I'm Paul Goldsmith. Keith Conrad, longtime radio producer, podcast extraordinaire. Welcome to the Next Simple Step Podcast. Oh, great to be here. You know, I think everybody thinks they have what it takes to do a podcast. We're here to talk you out of it, first of all, because <laughs> um, straight up, you don't. But if you can't be talked out of it, maybe we can help guide you, avoid some landmines, because Keith, you've been in the business of radio and producing podcasts for many years, and you've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, and and had some success along the way as well. And so you're just the man to talk to. So how many podcasts are you working with right now? I would say five that are consistent and producing content on a regular basis, and then probably about another five to six that are either just starting out and haven't gotten to that point yet, or they're sort of like, unfortunately, hit that pod fade stage where they're not producing content consistently. So probably about 10 to 12 in total. First of all, pod fade, define what you mean by that. And is there a specific time and place that most podcasters hit that? Pod fade would be basically, let's use the example of if you're doing a weekly podcast. Yeah. When you start off, you're all ready to go, and this is going to be like a continuous thing that you're doing that's part of your life. And then you do it for maybe a few months. Maybe it's as long as a year. Maybe you're busy one weekend, and you don't get around to recording an episode, so you skip that week. Maybe it becomes two or three weeks, and then suddenly you look up, and you haven't done the podcast in like three months. I intended to do it every week, and it was supposed to be a weekly thing, but now it's become a... Uh, you know, whenever I get around to it sort of sure. thing, you know, that, that the audience can't really depend on uh, showing up in their feed when they were expecting it. That's the definition of pod fade. How have you noticed people avoid that? The ones that don't stop, that keep the consistency going. Is there some trend or something they do other than they just keep recording them? How do you plan for success here? I think it starts at the beginning because... Most podcasts I'm working with are generally going to be weekly. So thinking in that mindset, you want to have a month's worth of episodes done before you even publish any of them. I would also make an argument that you want to have like that base that you're starting with. And I encourage them to have a month's worth of evergreen shows for that time that we decide we want to go away for a weekend. So we're not going to be able to record an, an episode you've got one that you can just plug right in there that's going to work so that your audience can expect that there's going to be one uh, every week. When you know you're working ahead like that from the very beginning, which is the easiest time to do that, that takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of you to come up with ideas every week. That's what podcasters need to think about doing at the beginning. Even if you can't go that far to actually produce the episodes beforehand, it's really helpful to have those slots filled mentally so that you're thinking a couple episodes ahead rather than having to scramble to do something every single week. Because like, you can do that once, but the stress you're going to put yourself under, that's going to be a huge turnoff, especially in the early stages when you're just getting started. Most podcasts, the second they had published, they aren't going to have... 50,000 downloads an episode, sometimes not even 50. It's very easy to get discouraged during that beginning time. So take some of that stress off you. I think you're going to be far better off. You know, if you can get 50 listeners in the first month, that's pretty good. I mean, how often do you get to maybe speak in front of 50 people at a time? Your family will tell you they'll listen and they won't. Let's just be straight yeah. about that up front. Your friends are not really going to listen. 50 may not sound like a lot, and you're not going to be able to make a living off of 50 listeners. But if you're just starting off and you're getting 50 downloads, think about it this way. If you were really passionate about something and you just said, you know what, I'm going to book an auditorium and 50 people showed up, that's a big deal. Like, that's yeah. actually pretty impressive. That is. What makes a great podcast now? The bar has really been raised. Now it's been close to a decade, you know, since Serial showed up. There were narrative podcasts before that, but that raised the bar. I tend to dissuade people from thinking that they're going to do basically an amateur talk show and they're going to immediately just blow up with that. How many successful podcasts can you think of that are just 
couple friends talking about stuff without any sort of overarching theme to what they're talking about. I would say there are even talk shows on the radio that aren't particularly good. <laughs> we could name names, yes. but so if that that's the case, what makes you think you're going to be better than the shows that actually have a platform on a radio station? Lowering the bar on that, having a plan makes a lot of sense. In the entrepreneurial world, there's the phrase, the riches are in the niches. And for me, it really is about motivation. Like what makes people tick? Everybody says they've got these big goals and dreams. Why aren't they taking action? Hence the next simple step. Let's just break it down into action steps and get to work and trust the process. That's my passion and hence the name. I've actually coached some people who said they wanted to start a podcast and because I had one and I worked in radio, they thought this would be a great idea and I try to talk them out of it and they can't be dissuaded. And then when it comes down to recording it, they get stage fright. They're just freaked out because sitting down behind a microphone, it's not as easy as it looks. People just freeze. From your perspective, who would benefit from starting a podcast now and what would be the best way to go about getting going? You said, you know, have at least a month ahead of time, but how do you go about naming it and coming up with a concept? In terms of naming it, I wouldn't recommend putting a prompt into chat GPT and just running with that, but it's a good starting point. From a technical perspective, after years of producing morning shows where literally I was kind of, on some days I was just handed a newspaper and said, here, what should we talk about for four hours? And I've kind of developed a good sense for what makes decent content. I worked with the Lyric Opera of Chicago to create a podcast that told the behind the scenes story of a production. It was their production of Macbeth. It was their first production since COVID. You'd be surprised at the interesting stories you can find when you're actually just talking to the sound guy about how he became the sound guy. Everybody's got a story. Everybody probably has a potential podcast in them. They need to talk to somebody who's not immediately in their orbit a lot of people run a business and decide that they're going to do a podcast associated with that business, but it is just two of the employees chatting and there's no real direction to it. You need that other brain that's maybe a little disconnected from your everyday life to help you find that angle that makes the most sense. Well, I think the key word there is story and everybody's got a story as talent coach Valerie Geller says, there are no boring stories, only boring storytellers. That's something I've been working on is being able to craft great stories. And I'm fascinated. One of the top business podcasts the last couple of years is called Founders, David Centra. He's simply talking about founders of businesses and he reads mm -hmm. like seven books on each of these founders. And he spends an enormous amount of time consuming information, content, stories about these people. These mm -hmm. books are all available. Anybody could do this, but he's committed to doing this one thing and telling their story holistically. And the podcast has really taken off. It's a big deal because he's got one theme and every episode is a different founder. And mm -hmm. now really big famous business people are quoting him and referencing it because he's kind of stuck to his lane and he's learned how to tell stories in a really powerful way. And he gives his perspective along the way when he shares a particular story and then what he thinks about it and how he's going to apply it to his life in business. You're working on a history podcast now. Tell us a little bit about that and what's that going to be like? Since a young age, I've been fascinated by the Titanic and I wanted to do something related to the, to the Titanic. The podcast, the working title that I have is The Moment Everything Changed. It's f telling the story of these moments in history where things kind of turned on a dime. The first one is about the Titanic because that had a huge impact on the beginning of the 20th century and really changed a lot of things about how the world functions in ways that I don't think people quite realize. It really kind of got the ball rolling that ultimately led to World War I. Not a direct cause, but it sort of created the environment that ended up being the result. There's a lot of other stories that are very similar to that. One that most people probably haven't heard of is the Tzard mission, 
which was right before World War II, right before U.S. involvement in World War II. As part of the Lend-Lease deal, the British realized that they had a lot of people creating a lot of really cool inventions that were probably going to be very helpful in winning the war, but they didn't have the industrial output to actually turn them into a reality. And so they gifted a bunch of them to the United States. The cavity magnetron was one of them, which would be involved in both radar and microwave ovens. When you go down the list of the things that were involved, many of the big industrial things in the United States over the next decade or so actually came from that. The most amazing thing about it is they literally took all the paperwork for all of these things, stuck them in a trunk, and then five of them just crossed the Atlantic on an ocean liner as civilians undercover. Another one is the Pacific Clipper. About the same time, Pan Am was running flights across the Pacific on flying boats. There was one called the Pacific Clipper that happened to be across the Pacific when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Boeing, which made those flying boats for Pan Am, also made the ones that the military was using. The U.S. government did not want those falling into the hands of the Japanese. So they told them, hey, we're going to send you home, but you're going to have to go the long way. <laughs> so they actually became the first commercial flight to fly all the way around the world because they flew from where they were in the Pacific all the way around the long way to New York, and it took about three months. There's a lot of similar stories in history. And the business model that I had in mind for doing that is to create a podcast that by itself is eight to 10 episodes telling the story that if you listen to that podcast, you would get a complete story and know what happened in this. But then in addition to that, create an audiobook that contains the content from the podcast plus doing a deep dive on all of the ancillary issues that come out of that. It occurs to me as you're talking that if somebody's just trying to start a podcast now, probably not wise to think about how you're going to turn it into a book or audio book, but this isn't your first podcast. And that is a brilliant idea. You're using it as a platform and then creating multiple different pieces of content because not everybody listens to podcasts, but they might listen to audiobooks or they might download a book onto their Kindle. I could tell you're legitimately interested in the content. That's the key there. If you start with just trying to sell something, you're not going to get very far, but it's interesting to be interested. So you're interested in the content and there are other people and it's fun to listen to you talk about those things that isn't my particular passion of studying these things in history, but I would listen because you made it interesting. I think that's a key that sometimes gets lost. People create content for the, what they think people want to hear rather than something that legitimately interests them. Like in the Titanic example, a lot of people would be interested in just hearing the story of the Titanic. But one of the side trips that I would go on is all the logistics that were involved because the Titanic was 20% larger than the largest ship before it. Literally, they had to rebuild the entire infrastructure for building ships just, to, just that, to build this thing. There are probably hundreds of podcasts that talk about the Titanic, but you're finding a unique angle telling it from that perspective, and I hadn't considered that. That's incredible. I can't wait to listen. You also had another podcast, The Greatest Story Ever Told. It was a play on that. It was The, the Greatest Story Ever Podcast. Somebody actually gave me a hard time for having the word podcast in the name. Uh -huh. And I said, well, no, I'm, it's actually a play on, on the greatest right. story ever told. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. verb. It's, not, it's not, just a, not just a noun. I did that during COVID for about a year. I was just talking to people about the craziest life experience that they've ever had. I talked to Dana Perino, who's a Fox News host and former White House press secretary. And I talked to her about the fact that she was flying on a flight from Denver to Chicago. She met a man, fell in love, and decided to ditch her entire career just meeting this guy on the airplane. That was before she was a household name. Obviously, yeah, it worked it out paid for off. Her, but it was right. one of the craziest things I ever heard. I had a friend who I learned was kidnapped by a motorcycle gang. That was fun, too. You just learned, How long were you their friend before they revealed that little fun fact? I had known her probably 15 years. I had never heard that story. 
My, lead with that. That's really interesting. <laughs> it seems like when you introduce yourself to somebody, you should be like, hi, I was once abducted by a motorcycle. Uh -huh. Well, now I'm compelled to go listen to that. Keith, if somebody's thinking about starting a podcast or maybe picking it up where they left off, what is a next simple step to really helping them develop the most compelling story? The thing that is going to put budding podcasters under the most stress is coming up with a with a topic every week. And, and if your workflow for creating the podcast is, we're just going to wing it every week, it's really going to stress you out and it's going to contribute to you being less enthusiastic about doing your podcast, right? The biggest small step I would recommend is sitting down and coming up with those evergreen ideas so that even if on a regular basis, you are just deciding, hey, we're just going to wing it, on those weeks where it just doesn't come together and that's going to happen, you've got that thing that you can plug in and be like, okay, we're going to tackle this topic this week. Hope is not a strategy. I think about the quote from Lauren Michaels who said, we don't go on because we're ready. We go on because it's Saturday night at 1130. If you commit to a weekly podcast, have a plan to get there on your worst week. You're sick or have family activities or whatever the case may be. You're going to hit life and resistance. And this applies outside of podcasting. Anything you're really committed to, you need to plan for the resistance because mm -hmm. if it's worth doing, you're going to face resistance. Assume it's going to be hard before you start and have a plan. Mm -hmm. And I loved your idea about the Evergreen podcast. When you just absolutely aren't able to record, you've got something already pre-produced, ready to roll. Maybe on a Saturday you record three in a row, so you're not always trying to get behind it every single week. Done is better than perfect. And get better as you go. I'm definitely a recovering perfectionist, but really that's hiding behind fear because people connect with vulnerability too. So there is no perfect podcast. There's no perfect book. It's art. Just create the art and it's not for everybody. Be okay with people that aren't going to like it, that aren't going to listen. It's not for them. As Seth Godin often says, your people will find you. You just have to be true to whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Trust the process because it's worth doing. And Keith, thank you so much for being on the Next Simple Step podcast today, giving us some pointers for those aspiring podcasters. Do you have a name for the history pod yet? The working title that I have now is The Moment Everything Changed. We'll see if that sticks or if I try to perfect that one a little bit more. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks cool. for having me.